Today's show is brought to you by Speaking Finance. If you're thinking about a personal loan to get a new set of wheels, then Speaking Finance will get you sorted. Fast, slow, big or small, Speaking Finance will make sure you get the car you desire. For the result of our first competition to win a $150 voucher for the Bomber Shop, stay tuned for the middle of the show when it will be announced. But for all your loan needs, visit speakingfinance.com.au. All right, let's start the show. I mean, it's nothing new that I'm the one who's carrying this podcast anyway, so... <laughs> Simply must play. There's nothing more likely than a bloke who takes a hanger, miss and a set shot yeah. straight after it. Yeah, give it a listen. Acting as if it's like a normal thing to do with salt and vinegar chips. I'm, I'm in a mood, Rob. How is this the little bonus content with Kevin Shady? Who are we playing this week? Who cares? I reckon I'm, I'm zero for three with creating segments at the moment. <laughs> Love of God, don't let us come... A slow start, a spirited fight back, an umpiring catastrophe, and a final quarter collapse. This is the Sash, definitely not the official podcast of the Essendon Football Club. I'm your host, Rob, and we're back on Zoom for another lockdown podcast here in Melbourne. And joining me is Damo and Jesse. Gentlemen, how are we? Yeah, not too bad. Thanks, Rob. Apart from the the fact that we're locked in our houses um, and can't do anything, um, not too bad. Jess? Oh, pretty sick of losing to Richmond, to be honest. <laughs> really sick of it. Really, 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 really sick of it. Aside from that, as, as good as you possibly can be after an absolute <laughs> roller coaster, it's just that game, I feel, just summarizes the emotion that comes along with being an Essendon supporter. Yeah. Yeah. No, nah, well said. Yeah, I'll tell you what, I'm 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 sick of uh, sick of listening to losing to Richmond, sorry. It's funny, like I have a lot of Richmond mates. Like I, you know, grew up around the area, and I've got a lot of friends who are born and bred Richmond guys. And I remember when we first sort of turned eighteen, like sort of oh nine, ten, eleven. Like they were rubbish, and we were just always winning dream time. And I was like, I would just rub it in their faces every single year. And yeah, now it's been what seven years since we've beaten them. It'll probably be eight because I don't think we're not playing them again this season, are we? So, thankfully not. Yeah, so it'll be it, it might be eight years before we finally get a win. Uh, but bit of housekeeping, boys, before we jump into the show. Um, we've had a couple of people who've hit up the page wondering why they can't listen to our Thursday shows. If you want to listen to Thursday shows, you've got to sign up to be a premium member. Uh, of the Horde, which is the group we're a part of to uh, help this podcast. So got some bumper interviews coming to those of you who have signed up. We've got Terry Danaher this week and Mark McVeigh. So absolute belters coming to you this week. Boys, are you excited for our, our guests this week? Well, what a combo, TD and Spike. So uh, one of the old, older boys and then someone probably we used to, we used to watch uh, growing up. So looking forward to uh, speaking with Spike. For sure. Oh. We've got a, yeah, for sure. And uh, we've got a few more in the pipeline as well. I might not announce who they are just yet, but we had to park a few just because of the COVID stuff. And these are people that we wanted to get in studio. They had to come in. Um, obviously, Spike's in Sydney, so that wasn't going to be possible yeah. for him. And um, it was easy for Terry just to get on the phone. But these people we've got lined up, they want to come in. They want to be with us in person because they're big characters. They're not just former players. They're just big characters in general. Um, I mean, you know, pe- people who've been listening the last few weeks might know who I'm talking about. But either way, he's committed. He's going to come in once this uh, COVID rubbish is done and dusted. So anyway, if you want to hear the extra content, sign up via the Horde for our premium shows, support the podcast, and uh, keep it going. Jess? I will just say, for any of those out there who are struggling to put together the 5 $6 a month, or whatever it comes out to be. What is it, Rob? Four ninety nine a month. Four ninety nine, exactly. Four ninety nine a month. There are a lot of people walking the streets these days due to lockdown, and the word on the streets, particularly around South Yarra, is that uh, lemonade stalls are back in fashion. So find your wood, squeeze some lemons, go to your next door neighbor's house, particularly if they're Greek, and just take all of their lemons <laughs> and just soda ice some water, and you've got your membership for the month. So jump on board. Beautiful, beautiful. We'll do whatever it takes, guys. And we appreciate everyone uh, who supports this show. Without you, we wouldn't be able to continue doing it. Let's get into the game, guys. There's plenty to review. Um, I feel like maybe let's start off with the goods because we're going to end up negative anyway. So I feel like let's get the positives out of the way. Let's celebrate those who were good on on the weekend. And um, the headliner of the show, um, Mr. Darcy Parrish, it's... uh, 
just week after week now. Ryan, we spoke about this after Anzac Day. You and I had the chat and we said we, he did it then. We want to see him back it up. And he's done that time and time again. Consistency. Consistency. That's, that's what we said. The great mids of the game, week in, week out. They know their job and they, they execute it perfectly. We didn't get the win, but bloody me, the bloody hell, the reason we got back in the game was just his four quarters of just brilliance. So, Br- Brownlow, chat, would you think? He's in, look, he's in the mix. Absolutely, he's in the mix. Um, there's no question. And I think as the Brownlow's shown, you don't necessarily need to be the best player in the comp to win the Brownlow, but you need to be able to stand out in your team. Um, yep. Especially seeing as, you know, we're, because we're not winning as many games as, say, let's say Melbourne with Clayton Oliver. The problem with, say, Clayton Oliver is that he's got all these guys around him who will take votes off him, whether it be Petrarca or Gorney or Lever or May or whoever it might be. With us at the moment, like, yeah, a few guys have had really good games, but you look at the past, you know, six, seven weeks, eight weeks, it's Parish every single week. And he's just climbed up all the leaderboards and all the different, you know, coaches award, you know, journal awards, whatever it may be. He's in the conversation, 100%. Can I just dig a bone here? What an absolute joke that he got and he got eight coaches' votes. Mm. I mean, that is a disgrace. What more can you possibly do? He only got eight. Dusty got nine. So Dusty actually polled better. And the article on the AFL website was uh, was Dusty Martin robbed of the Yayuka Award. And I mean, obviously that's up, you know, up to – I'm not downplaying Dusty's game because, you know, he was pretty good, but – if you get 44 disposals, I mean, how can you not poll higher than, uh, well, you only poll eight votes. I mean, I just thought that was an absolute joke, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, I, I looked at it and, you know, Bolton got seven. So what that says is that one coach gave Dusty five, the other one gave him four, and then the other coach gave, one of them gave, uh, would have given Parrish five and then given him three because for um, yeah. Bolton, he had seven, he got four and three. My belief is that, Hardwick would have voted Dusty five, Bolton four, Paris three. Whereas yep. truck, oh, prick. truck obviously would have uh, would have given it to him. But look, anyway, doesn't I'll... that just embody Richmond? Hardwick <laughs> doing that. It just <laughs> screams how shit of a club they are, and how much they annoy me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, du- Dusty was pretty bloody good, but yeah. uh, Paris was definitely better than Bolton. Yeah, exactly. So look, end, end of the day, like I'm not. I'm not too fussed about individual awards. Like obviously it's nice a place to get recognized and I'd be stoked for Paris to win one just like any other Essendon player. But the reality is, you know, we're here to win finals. We're here to win flags. That's what we care about. But we've now got this A grade midfielder, this inside bull, whatever the hell it is you want to be talking about that everyone's caught out for year and year and years, the clearance machine. And here he was and he was playing on the half forward flank the whole time. Yeah. So <laughs> I, was for, I was hoping for one of you boys would jump in, but I guess you just thought I was lagging there. I, but felt, I felt like I jumped in the, like the first two times. I was like, I'll just let Jess get this one. <laughs> <laughs> to, give, to give the uh, podcast a bit of context, I'm currently in a share house and I've got all this loud music playing downstairs. So I was absolutely freaking out that all of you could hear the music playing downstairs in my house. No, we can't hear it. <laughs> Good. can hear a thing, mate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we definitely, definitely can't hear it. But um, yeah. But Jess, the, this the, the this person we've been crying out for. I mean, it's funny how many of us on this podcast I and mean, the other SM people have always been like, "Why aren't we giving this guy the time that he needs in the midfield to develop?" And now he's getting the opportunity, and he's suddenly put himself into you know best players in the comp category. Mm. He reminds me so much of Job with the way that he plays in the middle particularly just with how clean he is with his hands, low his legs. It's got so much drove about it. Just picking the ball up off, you know, one leg whilst being pushed over and getting your hands out so cleanly. And I mean, he's obviously still so young at the moment, the upside for this kid. I don't even know what his ceiling will be at this point in time. I mean, if he had, have, you know, slotted one or two of those opportunities he had, that would have been the most complete midfield performance of an Essendon player I've ever seen, I would have yeah. said. If not, it, it, that's probably even without those goals, the closest performance I've ever seen. So, I mean, to do that at the age of 23, I mean, it's um, it's pretty pretty fucking exciting. I'm not going to lie. My, my French. 
Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, no, w- well said. And that's it. It's not as though he's some, you know, old head who's just a big body. It's just he's he's young, he's developed, um, and he get, he's he always is in the right places, whether it be in the forward chain or in the defensive chain. He's running back and forth both ways. Um, he's reading from the ruckman because, as, as we know, our rucks have not been very dominant recently. Uh, mm. Just finds his way to get it. So it's two, two good stats to mention here. Of course, everyone knows. So he broke the all-time Essen record for disposals, 44, um, which was held by Barry Davis. We got 43 against Footscray in 1949. So it's a fair while ago. Just That's before crazy. you continue on the second stat, hmm. was I was watching uh, the game with a friend at home and – Obviously, there wasn't a whole lot to cheer about in the last ten minutes, but we're all of we're, we're all of you guys like just get it to Parish, get it to Parish, and he yeah. got his very last disposal in the last five seconds. We we're like cheering as yeah. if we'd won the game. It's pretty <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Shows how pathetic we are. <laughs> oh, no. oh, God. Um, the other stat, and I think the one that's more more exciting is that uh, he's one. So he's, he's one. Sorry, he's equal now with. Tom Libertore for the most clearances in the comp. So center clearances, sorry, uh, with 52. So head and shoulder, those two are head and shoulders above the rest of the competition. Um, and as we know in footy today, winning it out of the center is so vital because you've got an opportunity to get it to one-on-ones in the forward line. Parrish is doing that for us right now. And mm. suddenly for years and years and years, basically since this podcast started, we've always talked about our inability to win clearances when it matters. Suddenly, Here's a guy who's now tilting it back to our favor and we can go, all right, we've solved that problem. What's the next thing we need to do to become a better team? So anyway, I'm uh, it, I'm wrapped with Parry. It, it does really make you question though, like what the fuck was going on the last two, three years? Yeah. Like, can we can we get Wilshire on and just grill him and just figure out him. why you don't put someone yeah. of Darcy's like, best clearance player in his draft? We take him so early and then we just sit him in a different spot and we've been crying out for someone of his caliber or of his caliber of you know getting clearances and here we are we've got the top clearance player in the AFL yeah. and he was you know in our back pocket the whole time yeah it's not it's not even just Wusha that we should question I mean it's the entire coaching staff we currently have I mean up until round three he wasn't playing in the midfield as yeah. a full-time permanent inside midfielder yeah exactly Very true that, that, that's a good point, Jesse. I mean, one of the things, maybe it was after Anzac Day, but it was after one of his really big games where he got interviewed, whether it was a club or, you know, AFL person. And that he was like saying how his, you know, his tank has gotten way better this year, how he's mm. running a lot further. And I can understand that as a reason why last year or the year before he might not have been getting that minutes. But as you said, Jesse, rounds one and two, he wasn't getting that opportunity. He was still playing half forward flank. We obviously were giving this space to Coldwell and Shield to do what they were doing. Meanwhile, there's a guy here who could have done it way better. And that's the question because he's, your tank's not going to change that much in two weeks. That's just the reality. Um, mm. So, yeah, it's uh, look, it's concerning. It's worked in our favor now that we've, we've got him there and he's in the role and he can continue to develop. But, um, yeah, questions raised. In saying that, what it demonstrates to me, though, is that he's got a champion mindset and whether that's instilled through coaching, uh, I feel that coaches need to bring the best out of players, but players need to have that burning desire to want to get the best out of themselves. Right. Now, he obviously was given this opportunity and he took it with both hands and he's not just run with it. He's absolutely smoked the park and left everyone in his streamline with smoke behind him. And at this stage, looking forward again as a 23-year-old, if he's got that mindset, I mean, again, it, it's very exciting to prophesize, to understand what his ceiling could be and how far he wants to take himself down that pathway and bring others with him. I feel that's probably the most important part, and it's definitely something that you're seeing in the culture of the football club these days, that it's not just players wanting to help themselves it's these champion players standing up and wanting to bring others up with them so if we can have you know four or five of these players you know merits mcgrath parish parish so in the midfield all you know those are the key cogs that you want as your champion players bringing everyone up if if they can continue on that trajectory then you know we've got the makings of a really amazing team let me ask the two of you a question 
Who would you put more money in front of right now, Parrish or Merritt? Gee, it's a hard question. I mean, two. I think three weeks ago it was probably Merritt, but suddenly, suddenly it's it's becoming Parrish. And you know, look, he's he's not going to go anywhere. That's that's the reality. He won't be going anywhere. Um, like he said, he wants to stay, just trying to get the deal done. Look, yeah, but each each week we don't sign him, it goes up fifty grand. Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, tough. I mean, look, I'm gonna say. I'm still going to say Merritt just because Merritt has the sample size. Obviously Darcy Parrish has done so much this year, but Merritt still has the history and has done more for a longer period of time. So it's more reliable to command more money. That's mm. oh, that'll be my, that's my answer. I'm absolutely on the same wavelength as you, Rob. I mean, to put together seven games of scintillating form, at that level is obviously different. It's not just seven games of very good form. It's obviously seven games of the most elite midfield form you can find. But in saying that, you, you can't just pay someone uh, an extraordinarily large amount of money based on seven games. You need to see it consistently over a number of years. In saying that, I would also have some, uh, I don't know, reservations around paying Parrish that amount of money at his age. I've just seen so many players that get those large payouts that end up coasting, and that would really concern me. I don't necessarily know if within, if it's within in his nature, but mm. at, at this point in time, you never know. It could be something that he just rests on. So I don't want to give him this huge achievement, um, you know, this reward for this achievement when it's really nothing – huge in the grand scheme of things there's still so much more work that he needs to put in to get himself up to that you know eight nine hundred thousand dollar contract mm. yeah fair and uh what about you damo what are you doing i don't know i don't know in terms of what the money i would spend but i think right now parish's role is more important okay. um to our success but i, I do agree both you know we're very short, small sample size um but whether that might be an issue as to why he hasn't re-signed yet. Maybe he's after more money or his, his manager thinks he should get more money. Whether mm. that means for us to sign him, we pay him a certain amount, but over a shorter period of time, just to make sure that he's, he's mm. consistent. Um, so like front, uh, end, front end his deal. Yeah. yeah, correct. So make it do a short two year at a fair sum, see if he's consistent, front load a fair bit of that. Mm. Um, but there's, there's so many options, but, I would like to start seeing um, some players sign because I don't know. I don't want to lose any. Freaking out over there! I'm (laughs) freaking out. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. No, I think we we want to see some pen to paper soon. Just let's get one of them done the bye week. That might be nice. Let's just get one of the deals done. We'll be happy there. Um, Look, boys, we've we've given uh, Darcy a good fifteen minutes, and he absolutely deserved it. But there was a few other good players uh, on the day. Who'd like to give me a good? You can go demo. Just go straight into the unicorn. Yeah, let's do it. Best best game um, in terms of, you know, how long he was in the game for. So the other games where he's been really good, he's died off a bit and we haven't seen him in the back end. But he was pretty consistent. I know There was a little bit of the game where I thought he did go missing, but he found his way back in there. He had one goal. Um, I think he had two behind. And those two were still very gettable. So he was pretty close to having... Uh, a pretty solid game. So, and was it two behind and one on the full as well? So you had yeah. four shots a goal. Yeah, yeah we don't, so it was one goal, one, and then the one that sort of uh, drifted across the face and was out. Yeah. The oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and I thought he, I thought he was definitely going to dob that that snap when he ran on. I Same. Almost, uh, almost put a hole in the wall at the house. <laughs> um, <laughs> was jumping up and ad- up and down. Um, but really good, and we've just got confirmation. Maybe only. 10 minutes ago that he's got the rising star. So um, if you've put your money on him, uh, it's for the Enjoy. reward. It's, uh, yeah, you start celebrating now. I reckon they'll pay you out pretty quickly. <laughs> I'm, I wouldn't be surprised. If he plays like one or two more ga- good games, I'll probably pay everyone out. It's such <laughs> a yeah, betting, betting's currently suspended. Yeah. I'll tell, you what I, I'll tell you what I love is just him when he's floating, like – when it's going inside 50 and you see like, you know, hooker one-on-one or Paco one-on-one with something. And then you just see out of the corner of the frame, you see Coxie just drifting in. You're like, 
here he comes. A unicorn galloping uh, in on a rainbow. Unicorn over the top. <laughs> um, yeah. Listeners, uh, if you go check out our social media, you'll see our uh, Unicox design, which I've just been flogging. Um, I've actually really just come up with a, I've come up with a new shirt design. Is it, is it off for, the top of my head. Is it for Zach the Reed Lot? Zach the Lot Reed? I'm, nah, not the Lot. I'm thinking <laughs> the we get, Lot. I'm thinking we have a beautiful, stunning Archie Perkins with his hair flowing whilst he yeah. rides a unicorn with Cox's head on it. <laughs> oh, that's so mean. Oh, my God. <laughs> Can we get yeah, can that. we get that drawn up? Uh, yeah, I'll I'll see what yeah. I can do. Or if 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 Perkins, if, if that yeah, lovely Perkins looking yeah. like Achilles from Troy. Yeah, I was going to say if that uh, the listener who did the um uh, the Peter Wright design, Footy Illustrated. If if you're listening and you want to do a um uh, oh what user not found his his account's been deleted. Oh, no, anyway, well mate, if you're listening and you want to do a a design of Archie Perkins riding a unicorn, we back that in. We back that decision. The unicorn with Coxie's head on it. Unicorn with Coxie's head on it. Because that's what that's what he is. He is a, yeah, he is a unicorn near Cox. And he was absolutely sublime. Um, rising star, as, as you said. Um, but just, I, again, just his work on when the ball's on the deck against a team like Richmond who tackles so incredibly well. And, you know, we'll get into the actual game itself in a second. Um, for him just to stick these tackles, like... So you think about think about the amount of tall young guys you've seen over the years who just wilt when they get tackled because they just haven't got that size. Like for a lean, skinny guy, he's really strong. Like compared to a lot of other you know guys we've seen over the years, um, for a guy who looks like he has no muscle on him, like he holds his own, which mm. um, I'm pretty happy with. Yeah, I love him. Yeah, I think, love. I think we all do. Um, Jesse, you got a good for me. Yeah, I I mean, how, how can we not mention Merritt in that game as well? I mean, going hand in hand with Parrish with over, you know, 35 touches or something along the lines of that. I mean, again, the tandem that him and Parrish have working in the middle is just so mint to watch. I mean, almost every time Parrish picks up the ball from the deck, Merritt is just running straight past him and it's just becoming this – Absolutely lethal duo. I mean, his kicking this year has gone to, I wouldn't say it's gone to another level. It's almost back to like 2014 level when yeah. he was just hitting everyone on the tit. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, we, we obviously say almost the same thing about Merritt every week because he's uh, an absolute jet and he's super consistent. But I, I definitely think that he deserves a mention with a yeah. huge performance. Yeah, he's little just like, little snap dinky kicks that he just does. And he just sort of finds people like he did it again in that game where he, he got, he got it to Perkins mm. um, who I think yeah, he did miss the shot in the end. Um, but of course, just, just, just his use, like his, his use is, you know, we've knocked him a lot at times when his use has been bad, but like, you know, there are, there are AFL players in the competition who rated him as their best kick going around. Um, and I think it's something that we can often gloss over. Um, when other people are doing certain things. But when it comes to just hitting someone in a tight situation, Zach Merritt is one of the best. Mm. Him and Bond would be the two best kicks in the league, I would say. Yeah. Hugh McCluggage is pretty fucking good. No, nah, fuck that guy. So- <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to do one last good before we start teeing off on a few things. Um, I thought Kyle Langford really deserves uh, to be spoken about. Um, you know, got a lot more time in the midfield with McGrath getting injured. Um, just again, found himself winning a lot of the footy, um, delivered, you know, decent, pretty decently inside 50, um, obviously kicked a goal, was involved in a lot of plays. Um, he started slow this year, but Kyle's back to where he left off last year. I think I said last week, um, and he's improved again. Like I, I had a couple of mates who were, you know, neutral, neutral supporters who watched the game and I've speaking about a few other things. They went to Langford's pretty good. And I was like, Mm -hmm. man, that's. And that's something you don't hear non Essendon people say often is um, praising, <laughs> praising Kyle Langford. And he, look, he's taken his time. He's had a lot of doubters. And, um, you know, whenever he does have a bad game, social media seems to get on him pretty quickly, old Lang is. Mm-hmm. But um, he's had two really, really good weeks. And now with our midfield running really thin, we need him to stand up. And for me, he's doing it so far. So I'm, yeah. I'm pretty impressed with Kyle. No, Absolutely. And I love it when. I love it when he goes forward as well. So he'll he'll sneak forward and he'll get one of those kicks. Um, and generally, or most of the time, he's uh, pretty accurate in front of goal, which is pretty important. 
For sure. Just one one more good was to see some diversity in Nick Hines' role over the weekend. They actually moved Martin him that. to a wing and a half forward. And to be honest, on a wing, he was hectically good on a wing. The amount of times that he got the ball out of a clearance uh, when we won that centre bounce, he was super damaging on the wing. And yeah. it's just good to see that diversity. If something's not going right or we need him somewhere else, particularly in a year where we are pretty down on numbers, it's awesome to see Hindy just do Hindy things and just continue playing the same as he always does, no matter where you put him. Yeah, well, he went because he went to half forward in the second half. Um, like I know he was on the wing as well, but like that yeah. was the thing I noticed. I was just like, oh, like oh, he's he's in the he's you know in the forward fifty. Um, like we'll, we'll get into the game a bit more details now, but I did like out, we really lacked forward pressure um, mm. on Saturday night. Massively, like, they were just walking it out of defence at times. Um, you know, and the few times we did stick tackles, obviously we didn't didn't get anything paid towards us, but. Uh, mm. The absence of Will Snelling, I thought, was felt. Um, and considering yeah. the night where Tipper was quite off um, for his standards, we just we were just lacking anything, which I think is probably why Hind went forward. Proppy, I would say, would be a better way to describe Tipper. Mm. He was l- labouring around the ground for three quarters of the game. I mean, when you walk, saw them walking off to the rooms, he was genuinely limping. So it didn't look like he was anywhere close to being at 100%. And I mean, if you want to be putting on forward pressure, running at 120 kilometers an hour or whatever, he hits at full pace <laughs> over three meters. It's pretty hard to do that with what looked like a slight hip flexor injury. It looked like it was sort of higher up on his thigh and that's mm. a pretty tough area. That's like all of your explosive speed coming from there. But yeah, it was, it was hard to watch at times, really hard. I mean, I think this is probably a good time for us to lead on to the bads mm. if we're, uh, that's we're ready going. for it. But uh, yeah, that was super evident. And it was just, again, something that we've seen for eight or nine years against Richmond, a total lack of forward pressure and just continuing to kick it to Grimes. Mm. And that was just the the story of the day. I mean, the amount of opportunities, even, you know, our our new Messiah, sorry, Kale, you've been pushed off the mantelpiece by Parrish for the time <laughs> being. <laughs> but Parrish was kicking to... There was a forward half turnover and Parrish got the ball, picked it up. It was like two minutes before half time, mm. And all he needed to do was just kick it like an extra five metres and get it to Kale over the back and just found Grimes right in between two of the players. And it was just the tail of the day, really. Yeah. Just kick it to Grimes or Bolter and let them rebound out like where witches hearts. How, how like, I understand that there, there are times that that is the right option, but how much of that, you know, should our forwards be actually rather than calling for it over the back against a team like Richmond who are known for just chopping it out should actually be presenting another option because it, it happens a lot. Like we know that Paco, it's, you know, Paco's favorite. He just does the, does the arm kick it in here. It's like, well, try There's some space opened up. We've got the turnover. We're going inside 50. There's a one-on-one opportunity and you know, it's, it's a percentage play. All right. We bomb it to a one-on-one situation, but sometimes against a team like Richmond, where they've got these season defenders who are the best in the comp, it, it might not work out. Like, I don't understand why the forwards shouldn't be trying to get into space. If someone's got the ability to, you know, if it's a Zach Merritt or someone, they've probably got the ability to hit you lace out. Why are we always calling for it over the back? Well, I feel in that game, particularly in the first half, uh, the our ball movement, went straight back to worse folds era. And mm. uh, I am noticing that when good teams set up their defensive structures around the ground really tight, I mean, looking at the footage from, you know, level three or whatever at Optus Stadium from behind the goals, when we were trying to move the ball out of our back line, even I, and I pride myself as being able to hit someone on the tit pretty well on a good day, <laughs> Damo, just for your own information. But in, in all, all jokes aside, it was pretty hard to see any player free. They set up the ground really, really well. well. So that in in essence made it tough, but I just don't think that we were causing enough pressure around the ground to turn the ball over. And generally speaking, you'll see uh, your forwards lead up to the ball carrier when there's a turnover. You saw that a lot with Richmond, whereas our ball movement was slightly more stagnant, which is probably what 
cause the forwards to not be able to lead into small pockets of space because we allowed too much time for the defenders and the midfielders to, you know, mm. fill those gaps. Yeah, no, I agree. And we were just, we were very lethargic out of blocks. Like if you I said think leaving the rebound or when they would rebound 50, mm. our midfielders just no defensive running whatsoever. And they were overlapping the ball so well. At one, at one stage, it's just like every time we would turn it over, there'd be three Richmond midfielders in the middle and they'd all just be handballing. And in between each handball, there wasn't an Essendon player. They're like There was no one near it. And it, yeah. it was, I was just sitting there being like, like, this is how we should be playing football. Like, how are these mm. players open? Like, they, they all just knew where everyone was and they were just dominating us. Mm. Like, and from the get-go, it was actually quite impressive to watch at some yeah. stages how, how good their ball movement was. Um, but I think that's also a bit of a blight on ourselves. Like, where, where were our midfielders? Were they front running? Were they following the ball? Were they not, you know, manning up on their men? So, it's you know, obviously we don't know exactly what was um, happening, but that's definitely what, you know, put us back after that first quarter. And then obviously we were slowly making our way back, but the damage was, was done fairly early and quite significantly. Yeah. Before you go, Jesse, that's the thing. Like, <clears throat> you have a slow start, you're playing catch up footy from that point. It, you know, you're, you're always chasing your tail. And like, yeah, obviously we did did finally get, you know, in front before it all fell apart. But, you know, you put yourself in that bad position. And like, if you said to me, one of these teams flew in the day before, I would have said it was us, the way we were moving. Like they were so slow, slow so lethargic. I think this is a thing that we're going to start to see now is unfortunately with a lot of younger guys who might not be that well conditioned. As much as we've had a great start this year, it's been awesome. I am worried the back half of this year, we may lose a few games that people might go, oh, we should win that because we're going to start to slow down. Mm. I mean, in, in saying that, it's obviously a factor. Uh, I genuinely back Sean Murphy, the high performance coach. Mm. He's obviously got some amazing um, you know, history on his CV. So as a high performance coach, mm. uh, I'm backing him into you know, uh, put in all the work that he's put into the preseason to allow for us to get through, you know, this season. But obviously that's a factor that you just can't quantify. You, you never necessarily know. Yeah. Another bad for me really was the first fifth, the first quarter and a half, just mm. flip getting absolutely destroyed by Chol. It was yeah. really hard to watch. I mean, Chol, he's not even a first ruckman for Richmond and, Phillips looked completely out of his league. I mean, obviously, from a matchup point of view, it was a disaster. Charles just super athletic, can jump higher around the ground, was clearly running flip off his feet because almost every single time Richmond kicked to Chole, flip was 10, 15 metres away from him. And, I mean, you're looking at the TV going, where are you, mate? Mm. Where are you? You just need yeah. to get to him and follow him around. Yeah. That really hurt us in the first... 15 minutes. I don't necessarily think it was all front running. It was obviously oh, a number of factors, but clearances and those taps yeah. were a huge, Chol just in general. That first quarter and a half, he was best player on the ground. And yeah. He crazy. Us. Yeah. He, he dominated us. And like Phillips, you know, Phillips did some good stuff when he, basically when Chol was off the ground, because Chol ran out of gas towards the latter parts of the game. Um, I still thought, Phillips's marking around the ground was quite good. Like he missed that set shot that he should have got. Like he should have kicked two goals, not just one. Um, I actually disagree with that because he on the wing in the last two, 20 seconds of that second quarter hmm. dropped a mark, just spilt through his fingers, went over the back and then Dusty kicked a goal. And it was the most frustrating mark to see dropped hmm. that I've ever seen. I mean, there was no one near his height and it just went yeah. straight through his hands. Like you're a ruckman. How do you not mark that? It's your one, one of your only jobs. I mean, he took two good marks on uh, Pickett, right? I mean, any any ruckman should be able to do that. So, I mean, I understand your point, but mm, I'm pretty keen it. to get Draper back. I'm not going to lie. I really oh, want to back are. after the bye. Yeah, no, we yeah. all like we all are. Like, you know, Flip is there to fill the gap of when Draper isn't fit. Draper hasn't been able to play, so Flip has been playing. Um, you know. That's just the reality of it. I mean, we may as well talk about injuries now. Um, I mean, I guess, actually, no, no, we're we'll holding it for a second. Um, look, obviously, we were a few men down in the last quarter, but they gave our team gave up 
Like when they got three goals up or three and a bit, and it was like 20, 22 points, like you could see heads were down. They knew it was mm. over, but there was still five, six minutes to go. Like yeah, the, car- they- the carnage didn't stop and it, it yeah. made it more painful. Mm. Like, it, it, the score didn't reflect that the game overall did it. Yeah, exactly. And like, it hurts me knowing that they gave up. Like, don't get me wrong. There were so many factors against us that day. And we'll speak about how bad the umpiring was in a second. Like, there were so many factors against us, but you don't like seeing guys give up. And that's how it felt. It felt like mm-hmm. they gave up. Um, you know, they were flat. They were tired. Everything else. We were, you know, we had no rotations left or whatever the situation, but they gave up. That's it could have easily had- been 50 points. Very, very easily. They had a couple of missed opportunities in that last 10 minutes, and it was pretty terrifying to uh, to see. But, look, in saying that, we've got to give the team a bit of credit. I mean, they've fought it out so many times, and I just genuinely think, as the, all the commentators have said, when a champion team flexes their muscles mm-hmm. like that, yeah. sometimes you just – you do just end up, you know, dropping your bundle a little bit. You know, you've you put in all of that effort, you've you've run your ass off, and then they just flex their muscles and run over the top of you, and it can be really tough. So I, I'm not too hard on them for that, but yeah. you know, it was hard to see. No, I I, I get that, and I, oh, sorry, sorry, I'll just quickly before you go down. I'm still, I was still so like impressed that we actually got back in front and got it back on our terms. Like I was sitting there at halftime. And like in, in during the third quarter at times, and I was just like, I was seeing my girlfriend, I was just like, this game's done. Like we, we've lost. Yeah, same. I was so surprised that we actually got back into it. And I was so impressed by that. But then, as you said, they flexed, they're a champion team. Um, I was actually, I, I should have done the stats on it, but like if, if you compared the games played for their side versus our side, like it's so far apart. Can I ask you two a question, Damo, just before you chime in? Have yep. either of you been more excited? Uh, when we keep when Waterman kicked that goal for a while, I mean, I can't remember being that excited. I was going <laughs> nuts. <laughs> if we had if we had footage at my house, uh, I would have gone viral. I reckon. <laughs> I um after the first quarter, well, there's not much to do on on a Saturday mm. in Melbourne at the moment. So I think I started off with a couple of Bloody Marys at, at twelve thirty in the afternoon. By the time the first quarter was done, I was absolutely hosed. Um, when Waterman kicked that goal, I, I almost took my top off and run run down the straight. So <laughs> I, I, I took the momentum, I took it out in the straight, and it never came back. So mm. I I got well ahead of myself. Um, I think we all but did. That's what I wanted to say. I think we missed out on a good before, and I think it was, you know, such a young list being able to, you know, come. What were we like twenty five points down at one stage? Yeah. You mm. know, against the champion side, bring it back to three points injured players. I mean, that takes a lot. Um, takes a lot to do that against such a great team. Um, so I'm still very proud of the boys. And I mean, that's, I think that's why I'm not hurting too much. Um, mm. Just because I, I was still thought it was a pretty, pretty amazing effort. And there's a lot, a lot of positive to take out of it, but it, then also this is a bit of a watcher thing. Also a lot to learn from that. Yeah. Um, and then that's, that's going to hold us in good stead for the future. So you, Look, if, if we're going to concede a game like that, let it be to Richmond. Because, mm. you know, we all know come, come you know, September, they're probably really going to be pushing it again. Yeah, and for sure. There's like eight, 18 of that 22 uh, with guys from the last flag. And, you know, most of them would be two or three time premiership players where, you know, a bunch of kids. And there were times where, yeah, it was men against boys. Like, We've got a handful of guys who are who are a bit older and more senior and have you know in a better stage of their career. But the reality is, like, the, you know, the core part of that that playing list is still you know sixty games, fifty games and under for a lot of them. Like, they're yeah. pretty raw, they're pretty young. Um, you know, some of them had some pretty bad games. We had a few guys in the team who reality is aren't in our first twenty two, but we just needed to get them in there. Um, you know, the fact that off the back of some really impressive efforts, like you said, whether it be Parrish or Cox or Merritt or Langford, um, to get us back into the game as a whole, it is still impressive. But, you know, it does And we missed some pretty there. easy chances in front of goal. We missed some yeah. really easy chances in front of goal. I think Paco missed a couple easy ones. Cox, obviously, missed one or, or two that were pretty easy. Um, 
And like, if we kick a couple of those, you know, we, we may have taken the momentum a little too far and, and could have uh, could have stopped their run or, or at least, you know, stop the bleeding. I'd like to see the statistics around, obviously we're all aware that Richmond doesn't start all that well mm. uh, and they haven't for the past four years and the second half of their years where they really kickstart their gears. I'd like to see the statistics around their win-loss ratio, ratio before and after dream time at the G because we could <laughs> be the catalyst to ignite their season every yeah. year. It's not a, it's not a bad shout actually. That is not a bad. <laughs> we are the igniter. We are the form generator. They love versing us. I mean, oh, you just could not? tell in the first five minutes, you're like, ah, oh, shit, we've got premiership Richmond playing yeah. today. Yeah. They were on. Um, all right. Let's, let's talk about it now. That was the worst display of umpiring since the 2019 Anzac day. It was totally effed, so bad. When David King, who is, we pot him every week, terrible. When David King is putting out tweets about the free kicks, you know something's wrong. It when changed- Dan Richardson, or Matthew Richardson, sorry, who's yeah. a Richmond faithful, is saying that holding the ball should go Essendon's way, that's yeah. when you know. Yeah, mm. like it changed the game. Like there were key ones where they got, they got two crappy frees that were kicked and then we were just denied blatant frees that could have resulted in a goal or at least just changed the momentum where the game was at. Um, changed the game. It's honestly a disgrace. Like, it was it was that bad. Like, when you got neutral friends who watched the game hitting you up going, man, you guys got dogged by the umpires. Like, you know it's bad. When it's not just us being like, oh, Essendon umpires against us. When, like, neutrals are telling you it's bad, it's awful. And that was one of the worst displays I've ever seen. What about the first free kick of the game? Where was it like Merritt tackled? Oh, that was such oh, a joke. Bolting, kicking into the forward line, and then that Collier Dorcas guy got a free kick in, in square. I was just like, um, I, didn't, I still don't even know what the free was for. That oh. in the it was a push. push back. It was, a, it was back. a push after he it was kicked calling it. the back, it but it was just tackle. Like he was tackling him as he kicked it, oh, and that, it was that Collier Dorcas guy got bloody four free kicks in, in, in front of goal. So we did give away. Um, you know, some of those free kicks in front of goal, which were very costly, obviously. But yeah, umpiring. Leads, lead, leads me to speak a little bit more about James Stewart. And I mean, at this stage, we're obviously still experimenting with Jimmy Stewart down the back line because really at this point in time, it's back line or nothing. Probably sees the end of his career at Essendon if he doesn't really fill this spot. Uh, the, the problem with Stewart at the moment is that we've had two forwards move to defence and one's really stood out, being Laverty, who's picked up the craft really, really quickly. So it's difficult because not many defenders pick up the craft within a year. I mean, you look at Kyle Hooker, who was an absolute spud for like three or four years mm. as a defender, right? So, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to give Stewart some time, but certainly at this, at this particular point in time in the season and, and looking forward for this year, I am very concerned when the ball's near him mm. one-on-one in the back line. Okay. You really just don't know what you're going to get from him. I'm happy to work with him, but he, he for me, over the weekend, it wasn't really that great. At ground level, good. But anything one-on-one spoiling, you just have no idea what's going to happen. He, he's more just filling the role until the, the lot fills out, I think. Yeah. Yeah, until just, uh, Big Reedy can get in there. Yeah. Until we fry up the bacon and chuck the pineapple inside the bun. <laughs> <laughs> bit, bit of beetroot. Bit, bit of beetroot. beetroot. Right Double crack and cheese. Mm. Yeah, get an egg in there. Get the lot, <laughs> in, there. Get the lot in there. Um, well, let's show about the injuries real quick. Um, I flagged this last Thursday, but again, with another bunch of injuries come in and I'm very worried about how far this list can be stretched because there is... There isn't much left, guys. There isn't much more backups. Like, I know at times we'll be like, oh, he yeah. can come in. Oh, he can come in. Like, the next... We've got the bye, week, though, don't we? Yes, yeah, so we've got yeah. the bye this week, which is good. So, we've got that extra week off, which helps. But, so, McGrath's confirmed PCL out for 12 weeks. Yeah, Zara is hamstring. We don't know yet, but let's just say four as an average. Um, mm-hmm. We'll see what happens with Tipper. I'm assuming it'll just be a small knock. He'll probably come back. But there's two guys who are already coming out of that side now. Um, bearing in mind that, you know, Ambrose came in as the sub. So Draper should be back post-buy. Um, I would expect Snelling's probably B 
thereabouts as well with his hand injury, but we're starting to run out of options to come in. So these are the mm-hmm. AFL list of this. These are the uh, pl- list of senior players who are listed as available right now. Um, sorry, Peter Wright will probably come back in as well post buy. But these are the players who are available who have played a senior game. Nick Bryan, Ned Carl, Marty Gleason, Zerk Thatcher, and Zach the Lot Reed. Gee whiz. Uh, I'm just putting Reedy in the, at the end because like we think he's got over his glandular, we don't know. And then obviously we've got a bunch of guys who haven't played McBride, Brand, Johnson, Hurd, Air, and Durham. I don't think any of those guys are up to it yet. Maybe, maybe Durham is the closest of, of, of them, but this next couple of weeks, like, yep, all right, we, we'll probably get Smith back in, in like three or four. Cutler might come back in three or four, but he's obviously Ooh. not that great either. Like, we're at capacity. This list can't get stretched much further. If we have another couple of bad injuries or someone gets suspended, like, we might be throwing in some guys who are not ready. And this is where you look at games coming up where you go, oh, we should beat Hawthorne or we should beat North Melbourne. We might not. We might mm-hmm. lose. We might not be able to field a good side and we might lose these games. It is very worrying. So mm-hmm. people need it's to think that- about this because this back half of the season, as much as there are a lot of winnable games with a full strength side, we might not win them. We might lose a lot of shit games coming in the back half of the year. That's yes. scary. Definitely damning and super, super scary. I never thought I would say this, but I was, I'm actually quite uh, sad that Zarakis went down. I kind of felt as if he was starting to hit his stride a little bit that game, mm. build a little bit more confidence. I mean, that one passage where he sold a bit of candy to someone in the middle mm. of the ground was just so mint to yeah. see that. And it was just a nice experienced head to have on the ground and I mean it, this poor guy just can't really get his body right anymore by the looks of things it's almost like a we'll be chatting to Spike McVeigh about all of this I'm sure tomorrow night but similar to him toward the tail end of his career just every time he got up could only play two or three games and then was back in rehab. yeah exactly so yeah look it's worrying um you know David I think you know I think now that he is is getting he's becoming injury prone. I think that does put a bit of a cloud about his future. Like he was obviously, you know, in doubt as well to go on. But I think if he's getting injured, that's not going to help him. Um, and then of course, yeah, anyway, but we'll talk about list stuff later. Um, I'm just gonna throw in one more bad in there. Yeah, go for in, it. Uh, Archie Perkins just like also not take everyone on all the time. Mm-hmm. It's, and just have a little bit more ability to just just not see him use the first option once when he got the ball. And you know, we've all played football. We all know that you're taught to give the first option. And I love that he likes to play on and I want to encourage him to play on. But someone does need to pull him aside and just say, sometimes you just need to give the first option in AFL football because you're going to get drilled. Yeah. And it became pretty relevant over the weekend with Richmond's tackling pressure that he just couldn't dance around a player because three more would jump on him and tackle him. It's funny. It's funny you say this, Jesse. So I, I had a chat with um, you know, my you know business partner and our good friend at the debrief, and he was saying to me, he's like, man, you know what? Perkins would have been that kid in under, under you know juniors footy who just breaks every tackle all day long, and that's what he does, and he's used to doing that, and it's great. Like you said, it's great that he has the confidence to do that, but you're a hundred percent right, Jesse. Like it, it's it's all cool and razzle dazzle when he takes someone on, beats them, but. It's not always there. It's not always there. And there was quite a few times where he got caught and then didn't get rid of it properly, or he got caught and then got spun around and maybe just got it out. By the time he had, you know, Merritt or Parrish, whoever it was receiving, was flat-footed and couldn't do much with it. Um, so, yeah, no, it's, it's a great point, Jess. We obviously love Perko, but sometimes you don't need to be flashy every time. Just take the option. He, he, did, he did break a few, but the option of, like, mixing it up is also, you know, to evade the opposition. So... Right. I mean, if you're always going to take them on, everyone's always going to know, you know, just tackle him mm. straight away. Um, and generally, you know, as Jess said, the first option is generally like 70% of the time, <laughs> the better option to take anyway. Yeah. Um, so he needs to mix it up just to, you know, his scouting report so it can mix up a little bit or else he's just going to start to get, get drilled. But yeah, he, he would, you know, on Damo's staff leading the AFL in uh, breaking tackles. So good on him. Exactly. Uh, let's take a breather and we'll come back and we'll have a bit of a mid-season report 
and we'll read out some uh, answers from the fans on social. Remember that today's show is brought to you by Speaking Finance. For any loan, big or small, they are the team for you. Now, we're happy to announce the first winner of the competition to win a $150 voucher to the Bomber Shop, and that's going to Alfie Sanchez. So congratulations, Alfie. There's a voucher coming your way. Uh, Steve from Speaking Finance will be in touch. Um, also, quick shout out to um, a few of the runner-ups who also had very good answers to the question that was put on uh, Facebook. Jake Croucher, Aaron Barnes, and Nick Steffen. So thanks for being involved. Sorry, no prizes for you boys, but keep an eye out for the next competition. Thanks again to our sponsor, Speaking Finance. Make sure you visit speakingfinance.com.au for all of your loan needs. Okay. Mid-season report, boys. We've got the responses here from the faithful, but I thought I might just give you guys a couple of quick questions before we get into it. Um, pretty basic one. Um, out of 10, how do you rate the season so far? One being a complete and failure and 10 being the best possible thing you've ever seen. Um, I'll start with you, Jess. What do you reckon? I'd honestly give it an 8 out of 10 uh, in, all, in all honesty. Yeah. I mean, uh, and that's putting into perspective what, uh, if, if you're looking at it from like a board and an objective point of view, uh, if you're looking at, you know, what we were tailoring to be a good season at the beginning of the year, our success wasn't a premiership. Our success wasn't top eight. Our success was building a sustainable game plan that will, you know, provide us stability and success over the next three or four years. And, um, you know, to blood young players to get these new draft picks in, I, I can't see any of those boxes not being ticked at this point in time. Mm. Uh, I would say the only reason why it, I'm not giving it a 10 out of 10, uh, okay. which I very easily could give based on what I've seen so far is just simply because firstly we lost to Carlton yeah, and that's always going to put me down because I hate that. Sin. It's a sin. <laughs> yeah. But it's just, there's, there's probably if, um, also, uh, you know, a few close games that we, we probably should have won uh, that we didn't end up winning, which is why I'm not going to give us that absolute 10 out of 10. But really, all in all, I mean, I, I can't ask for more than what I've seen this season. It's been a really good first half of the year. Oh, very nice. What about you, Damo? Let me just, uh, I'll, I'll give my answer by reading this out. Uh, Carlton will undergo a mid-season review of David Teague and his assistants. So my answer is 10. Going very well. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't be happier. We've, we've, uh, we've done it, fellas. Now, I was going to answer the same way Jess did. So overall, in terms of the direction the club's going, you know, I, I, I put it up pretty high. Um, so in, in that eight, eight range as well. In terms of, you know, where we're at in the ladder, um, you know, we're probably obviously around five, six. But in terms of the list that we've got and where... You know, we. I think that we were going to be. It's much higher. So yeah, I'm very happy around that seven eight range. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I was. I was going to go a seven. That was where I was sort of sitting. I was like, well, yeah. Where we started in our prediction for the start of the year and where I thought we were going to be, we're just a bit above that. Um, I think for me to push into the high brackets, those you know closer games, Jesse, you mentioned if we got those and won a few of those games it was a bit more in our favor i think we could probably push high like you know round one still still really irritates me um the carlton game as well really annoys me um as does gws so those games it, yeah. they, they piss me off a lot so yeah seven for me um we'll go through some of the responses so we basically asked the faithful what what's working what's not working so i'll grab the first one here which is I know, a bit more of a general statement, but I, I really like this one. So this is from Sue Burley. As I know this may seem trivial, but at the start of the year, uh, every media outlet has finishing bottom four. <clears throat> now it appears the narrative is totally different. We're now one of the most exciting teams to watch. So full credit to Ben and the coaching team. I haven't been this happy with, the, with our side for a while. I look forward to watching us play, even if we lose, because the four-quarter effort is there. Um, I think that's absolutely spot on from Sue. Like a lot of people now knowing that we're going to go to games and we're going to give, give our all, you know, rain, hail or shine might not work out, but you're not sitting there going, all right, you know, there's nothing working here. There's still a plan. There's something working. So I'm very happy with that one from Sue. Uh, who's got the next one, boys? Hold on. I don't mind. I can uh, take this one. Uh, what's his name? Deef Ad Adim uh, or Deef Adim. 
What are we thinking mm-hmm. there, fellas? D for Jim. Right. D for Jim. I know it's an, it's an Instagram <laughs> handle, so who knows? Makes it, oh, makes it hard. Mine's stupid. Uh, why do other teams go coast to coast so easily from their kick-ins? Uh, when we score a point, other sides seem, uh, other sides see it as an easy transition. Melbourne put Cosby Pickett about 20 to 30 metres out to put pressure on the kick-in. Why don't we use Tipper in a similar role? I mean, I don't know. It's hard. It's all, you know, you don't know game plans. Um, you don't know the zoning that each team um, is popping in. So it's hard to comment on that. It's something I probably haven't picked up on too much either. And don't fix what ain't broke. Tip is all Australian small forward at the moment. Don't change his role, please. Yeah, he is. He um, might have had a bad week, but he's still uh, he's still on track. Uh, next one, Jess. Uh, Brad O'Brien, absolutely can't fault the effort. We have a clear game plan that works. We do need to improve our disposal under pressure. Uh, yeah, I feel it's a bit of a uh, common trend at the moment that as a supporter base, we're all, uh, we've been yearning for some consistency, um, you know, with our game plan. We've been, you know, just yearning for a game plan and a game style. So to see that, you know, over three, four quarters every game yeah, and to, you know, trust that, you know, we're going to bring a, uh, a certain, uh, you know, game style that will work on the day more often than not is uh, certainly allowing my stress levels to reduce week to week, which is really good. In terms of uh, disposal under pressure, yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, we've still got a super young team and we've seen that when we verse when we verse top four, four sides or even top six sides that bring that heat, we do uh, seem to revert back to, you know, older tactics. So I agree with everything you're saying there, Brad. Good input. Uh, next one's from, <clears throat> gee, I'm losing my voice. Uh, Bombers always, three losses under four points. Rutten knows what he's doing. So I think it's just to say that even though we are five and seven, you know, it could very easily be eight and four. Um, we've been in those games, although we don't want to end up being Carlton who celebrate how many near wins they've had um, over the over you know, the past few years. But it is a sign that this group, you know, has been in so many games and there's really only three, like probably three that really stand out as games that we just weren't in at all. So mm. spot on there from spot Bombers on. always. Who's the next one? Uh, Rob Scott. So what's worked uh, for me as a fan is watching Chuck really put an emphasis on the Essendon FC heritage. Whether that be training at Winter Hill uh, or getting legends in for jumper presentations, I've liked how he's uh, really tried to use the past as motivation for the future. And in terms of the improvement, not a criticism at all, but the improvement will come in persisting with, the, with playing the younger brigade and really growing a core group of players. I agree with both of those. Really love the whole heritage side and, um, you know, bring, you no, know, what do we call it? The blue collar footy um, back to the club. Um, and in terms of the improvement, um, persisting with the younger guys, yes, to a degree, you don't want to play um, someone when they're too early and, and ruin their confidence. But with the call that we've got at the moment, um, I agree in persisting with them. Well said. Oh, we've got Carl uh, Scary here. Uh, individually, defenders have been good, but hasn't worked as a system yet. There's still lapses of concentration and spoil each other too much. Midfield has been awesome, but issues now with McGrath being out. Forward line is looking promising, but need to fix the accuracy for goal. Although big tick from me. Yeah, look, first point uh, I would agree with. I mean, as a, uh, a, a collective team, uh, we've, this defence has had only, what is that now, uh, 11 games with mm. one another. Uh, so certainly to, to learn a cohesive system is going to take far longer than that. Uh, obviously would love to see uh, more consistency, but that's just something that's going to come with time. Mm. Yep. I agree. Also the midfield has been amazing. I mean, it takes me back to, you know, Anzac day in, you know, 2011, 2012, just watching this absolute, you know, workforce of a midfield in the Collingwood team, just killing us week in, week out thinking, you know, when are we ever going to have a midfield like this? And, Looking at our team now, we're really building, you know, the bedrock of a team that could look and appear to be, you know, an elite midfield group. It is damning having McGrath out. McGrath is our second highest clearance player, um, not Merritt. So to have him out and he's our second highest contested ball winner, not Merritt or any other player that we have. So to have him not in 
the engine room is certainly going to be really difficult. Uh, so to see what happens from here on out, I mean, anything really goes. And your last point, we've actually been the second most accurate kicking team in front of goal mm. this year. So I wouldn't actually necessarily say that is a negative, although over the weekend, it's probably the only thing that you're thinking of, Carl. <laughs> I, mean, I can hardly forget it myself. But uh, yeah, look, certainly as compared to previous years, it's been a massive improvement. Um, before I go to the next one, I sort of bring up a couple of points on that. It's fun. I, I was actually thinking, yeah, like during the game on um, Saturday, although, you know, one is a premiership defensive group and then one is a young, you know, growing group. There's a lot of similarities about the types of players that we have in our back six and the Richmond back six in that you've got a group of these you know, mid size, mid to key size defenders who, and we're playing a very similar sort of system where they quite chop and change of who goes to who, and they're all sort of looking after it. Um, and yeah, obviously if it can develop to where Richmond has, you know, you're onto something pretty special, but I, f- I found there is a lot of similarity in the way that they play and the way our back six is trying to, is trying to play and that they're sort of working mm. for each other. So well, Rutten was the defensive assistant coach for awesome. them in 2017. So it only makes sense that the same system that they were mm. using then is effectively what he's using now. But the Essendon version, as he yeah. says, right? Yeah, version. It's, Essen- it's Essendonified. It's just a bit yeah, fast. That's right. <laughs> uh, next one's from Harley Raptopoulos. G'day, Harley. Uh, what has worked? We have a cohesive game plan for the first time in a long time. The kids are more than all right. And we are really starting to look like a team that wants to play for one another. What needs improvement? Still too many lapses in games. Can't seem to rectify a run of goals against us. Our forward entries still leave a lot to be desired. A long way off the cream of the crop. Um, yeah, the lapses in games hurts. I mean, all the, the lower you know, rank sides have sort of got that same sort of problem. Forward entries is funny. Like you look at game, the games where we're not pressured. You can see how, how good our forward entry can be. You take you know, the St Kilda game and the North Melbourne game. We do have the ability to cut teams apart when they don't bring the pressure, but it's showing the ability to do that in a high-pressure game. And the reality is pressure's going to be there when it matters. Um, a mate of mine said to me, referring to the Richmond game, like, you know, we spoke about how the Richmond team at the time was waltzing the ball from one end to the game and the other. That doesn't really happen in finals. Like you might occasionally see an elimination final where the eighth place set team gets blown out, you know, like an Essendon has. Uh, but the reality is when you come to deep finals, teams don't get that space. You don't get to the final four or the final six sides, leaving teams out in the open. So it's a great point, Harley, that we do need to rectify that ability to be, you know, use the ball well um, when the pressure's on. So Courageous would be the, the word I would describe it as. It's uh, a lot of the time biting off a pass that is risky in those games uh, where you definitely could get eaten up on turnover. But there were a few passes in that game where we were stuck in the you know back pocket where you know there were those small 15, 20 meter kicks that were 45 meter angle kicked into the corridor or you know between two Richmond players where sometimes just bite it off and hit it. I feel that we've adopted that much more, but the game style where I saw that flourish the most was under Heard, where our ball movement was so aggressive and he instilled so much confidence into the players to move the ball uh, so dangerous, dangerously and with so much courage that, you know, at the end of the day, uh, these good teams, they're going to do their absolute best to put up defensive structures. But if you don't, if you don't take those risks then you're not going to get any reward. Mm. So I just, I'm seeing the makings of it. It's not at that herd level where we were just chopping up teams, but Mm. I'd love to see the coaching staff keep instilling confidence into the team to have that courage to, you know, bite off a a pretty difficult pass if they need to. Yeah. No, it's a good point. It's a good point. Um, Do you want to do the last one there for us, Damo? Let's pick one of those two. Um, So, Tim Carroll, uh, he says, I'm happy so far. Uh, one team, tick debt, uh, com- compete in all games, tick. Uh, Parish, Merritt, Laverde, Tipper, tick. Uh, shoot in defence, don't think he's too happy about the basic errors, um, the five goal plus blowout, and uh, bombing into the forward 50. So, I think our bombing into the forward 50, look, it obviously still exists. I think it's gotten better. Um, and obviously, I'm happy with all the other things the team's agreed with, especially uh, the Parish, Merritt, Laverde, Tipper, 
all doing so well. And we can also chuck a couple other people like Hind in there. Um, and I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know where I sit about Stuart. Mm. I think I was like sort of happy with it, like see where it goes, and then sort of lost all confidence um, on Saturday night. Just, just the free kicks yeah. were just they yeah. hurt. Bad game, yeah. A bad game for a kid and he can do it. He had one really bad rebounding fifty kick that cost us as well. Yeah, yeah. He was far from. Was that Um, the one in? Was that the one in late in that last quarter where it cost us our second or third goal? Yeah, my memory's a bit hazy, but there was one where I was just absolutely (laughs) livid. (laughs) Yeah, I think I think a few of us were pretty uh, pretty hazy on Saturday night. Um, I just want to ask you guys a question before we wrap up because my laptop's about to die. So that's probably a good sign that we've been running for long enough. Um, McGrath's out. There's a massive hole left in this midfield now. Who's getting the minutes? Um, people, some, A few people have spoken about the possibility of Heppel going back in the midfield and that's bringing in a defender because we've got fit defenders. Um, what do you guys think is the best solution at the moment? Oh, I'm not too sure what the best solution is, but I, I, I bet you like Ned Carr will come in or, or something like that. I I don't know what the best solution is. With I don't want it to be Ned Carl, um, but I can definitely see something like that happening. Jess, what do you reckon? Into the midfield, are you saying? Yeah, because there's there's a there's a hole there. There's a gap to fill. There's some minutes to be played. Yeah. So who's getting? So I meant Damo though. Are you saying Carl into the midfield? Like pop him into the wing, then move someone else into the midfield. Um, I'd like to see Paco back in there a little more. Yeah, as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but. Yeah, when Nick, you Nick Cox Rover, in. Nick Cox Ruck Rover. Yeah, get him, just get, get him, him everywhere. There. Naturally, get him you can do there. it. Just get him in there. Back, back pocket, Nick Nick Cox. Yeah. So when you read out <laughs> when you read out the available players before Rob, it actually started to get very grim. Before I, yeah, yes, I almost started tearing yeah. up. Yeah, look, I don't want to be the you know like the, the pessimist because um, I'm still very happy with how the team's going, and you know despite what happened on Saturday night, I'm still very 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 proud of this side. <laughs> But it might get very grim very soon yeah. because we're running out of talent, boys. There's not much left. I mean, there's times like in your club's list in the time throughout the year where, you know, young players get that opportunity and it's, it's super beneficial. And we've already seen it this year. And it's like when Fantasia and Tipper got the opportunity when we had the drug saga. Mm. But I think we've already, we've run dry. We've already got our, our young players that play well in they're they're gaining their mm. experience and I think we're we're sort of just at the the line um Plus where we where we get get down to the the ones that you know probably I don't know won't have too much success but I don't want to be mm. there of bad news you never know there there might be a couple more guns guns down there. Mm. To answer your question I think in the most ideal situation Rob it would be uh, moving Heppel on ball and having Zach Reed fit playing at half back in Heppel's role. I mean, he can play half back. He's been drafted as a key for. Well, I, I actually yeah. believe that he was drafted more as a half back than he was a key forward. I mean, a key so, defender. So who? Sorry, Zach Reed. No, he's no, a key. He's, he's, a key de- he's a key defender. You might be thinking he's of someone else. Yeah, no, he's, he's back. Are you sure about that? Yeah, yeah, no. He because was, in their scouting profile, they said that he could play half back as well oh, because he was well, such a good kick. Well, so I mean, he's he's the lot. He can play wherever he, he wants. He's really. the best kick in the team. Yeah, exactly. He can do, he can <laughs> well, do whatever look, he wants. <laughs> I, 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 look, I, I personally, uh, we've we've got an ability to play around with our list at this point in time, and if he can't move into a fullback role because of Stewart's there or someone else, then. I don't have any problem with trying him at half back or moving someone else to half back. So it allows Heppel yeah. to move into the midfield. I really think the moral of answering this this question is that Heppel needs to come back into the midfield. And I actually fully back him to play well in the yeah. midfield this year. I think I think he's well, he's I think he's the best option of who we've got available, to be honest. Like, yeah, right, you know, one of the forwards, like a packer could have some minutes or typically have some minutes, or Waterman could be at a center bounce. But for someone who can run around the ground, has done it before. I, I, contested I ball. I don't, I don't think there's any other options. Um, I wouldn't, look, I wouldn't be surprised if you saw Marty Gleason getting some games this year, which might irritate some mm. people, but he's a half backman who can come in, um, you know, like he's, he, ever since he broke his foot, he was never the same player again, but, you know, he might get some time. Um, again, you might see Zach Reed play there, but yeah, there isn't many other options. So it, it might just uh, have to be the skipper. So, 
boys, let's wrap up. Um, my computer's about to die, so we may as well get our final thoughts out. Great show. It's been a good half, first half of the year. Um, Jesse, your final, your final words before we wrap for an evening. Great year, Don's fans, so far. For any of you that are feeling a little lowly after the weekend, have no stress. I mean, there's so many positives that we can draw out from what we've seen so far. Uh, you know, the bedrock, the pillars are being uh, assembled at the moment for what could possibly be, you know, a really successful football club. So don't look at wins and losses as, you know, the narrative to this year. Just look at week to week and the improvement that you can see in the game plan and, you know, the, the, the players, particularly the younger ones. Well said. Damo, final thoughts, mate? I'll keep it short and sharp. Um, it could be worse. You could be Adam Saad. <laughs> <laughs> That's been done. Uh, yeah. It's Carlton and Collingwood. Get a dog up yeah. Absolutely get a dog up. Thanks, listeners, for staying tuned. Thanks to uh, everyone who's listened to today's show. Thanks to those premium subscribers via the Horde. If you want to listen to bonus content this week and future, make sure you sign up and support the show. In the next week, we've got Mark McVeigh and Terry Danaher. I might release it in one episode. I might do them as separate episodes. I'm not quite sure just yet, but two bumper interviews this week. More to come. A few special guests, and we can't wait to get back in the studio with a few more people. So thanks for listening. Go Dons. Go Dons. Go Dons.